media surrounding the game, uh, which is a pretty broad panel we've got, but uh, a lot of interesting ways we can go with that. Hold on, you guys, we're starting the panel now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, all right, so transforming games, multimedia surrounding games. Uh, I'm Christian, and I'm joined by Solon Scott and Khalif Adams. If you guys just want to introduce yourselves really quickly, uh, Solon, go ahead. Uh, well, my name's Solon Scott. I uh, am on YouTube. I date boys. That's my business. That's my business model. Um, no, I'm a, I'm a let's player. I've been doing this for about three, four years. Um, and a lot of my channel right now has been analyzing dating sims. I play through a lot of them, uh, as well as also uh, weird RPGs. Um, and I've done a lot of talks places talking about the art form of Let's Play. Uh, I'm also the, I was the host for Indie 3 and the Alternative Digital Arts Festival, which are both um, very radical digital, um, they're all virtual conferences. So all of the content that is generated for the conference, like E3, uh, is actually offline or it's, it's online. So we have people submit their work, and we do our best to uh, give every work that is shown a uh, like a, their day, their spotlight. Um, and we take anything. We take any kind of game, whatever state it's in. That's what ADAS is for. Um, it's very cool. It's very exciting. Um, other than that, I do a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, with with game design and with stuff, you can find me on Twitter. But that's me. That's what I do. Okay, cool. And uh, Khalif? I don't do much. A <laughs> uh, little, little something here and there. <laughs> Not much at all. Nothing. Uh, no, I, I run the Spawn on Me podcast. Uh, kind of gave you spiel a little bit earlier before, but we do a, a, a weekly show that uh, spotlights folks of color in the industry and marginalized folks. Uh, so we do that every week. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, so this is uh, multimedia surrounding games, and you know, obviously, there's a reason we picked both of you for this panel. Oh, uh, <laughs> so if we could just talk a little bit about how you got started uh, doing what you do, which is uh, Let's Plays on YouTube and the uh, podcast Spawn on Me uh, and Rainy Day Let's Plays. So, uh, Khalif, if you want to tell us a little bit about how long you've been doing podcasting, how you got into that? I hated my job. <laughs> I used to work in IT uh, for a municipal union back in New York for their legal department. And uh, I've always loved games. I've been gaming since I was three. My carpal tunnel tells me so. Um, and uh, I decided that I said I wanted to make a, a, web, a website first to kind of talk about games and do it from another, another angle. But no one read it. So it didn't really work. Um, and then two years ago, we started the Spawn on Me cast, and we said, you know, what are we going to do in the space that's different? Because a lot of folks have podcasts. We've been seeing shows kind of going for a long time. Uh, kind of shout out to the folks who've been doing it for a while, like GTR, Gamer Tag Radio. They've been doing that stuff for about 10 years or so. And we said, what would be the niche for us? What would we be able to do that no one else is doing? And we said, no one is talking about gaming from our perspective. We have three black dudes who are on, on the show. But also, we wanted to talk about not only just the games that we play, but the experiences in the prism that that kind of gives you when you're looking at the games and experiencing the games that you have. Um, so we've been doing it for about two years. A kind of angle that we like to kind of focus on is um, having folks on the show to talk about their games but more about themselves because I find that that's the better angle, that's the more interesting angle, the one that I kind of go home and think about more often when uh, after we have a guest on the show and we've been able to have some amazing conversations with, with folks like uh, Lee Alexander. We talked about um, her being biracial. I don't think she had a, a discussion about that ever. Um, ever narcissist about being um, a journalism, uh, a journalism, a journalist. <laughs> He's a journalism. I do a journalism. <laughs> I'm a journalism. Um, about being a journalist and talking about uh, things through that prism. And then I think last night, oh, the, the Jaffe episode was really yeah. interesting because we talked about the N word, which yeah. I would have never thought we would have had that discussion with David Jaffe before. But now that you say that, it makes sense. Like, yeah, it like, lines up. Like, that would be very interesting. It's re and that it's sounds amazing. So we, so we we kind of hope that when folks come on the show, we want them to basically have a, a platform that they can talk about anything and everything and have a safe space and, and be able to do that in, in ways that they hadn't done before because there really is no other show that they can do that on. So that's what we do. 
business. That's awesome. And how long have you guys been uh, doing that podcast? Uh, almost two years now. Yep. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, so, well, you talk about your play? the origin story of Rainy Day Let's Play. Hmm. Uh, it was raining in Seattle. And so, <laughs> let's not go outside. Let's stay inside and play games. Um, about 2011, I was pretty much in, looks like this guy's seat right here. Um, I was at the University of Washington, and I wanted to create something around games, um, but I didn't really have, uh, all of my writing really wasn't going the places that I wanted it to. Um, and my friend pitched to me a, a Let's Play channel. He was like, why don't we do something like Yogg's Cat? Why don't we do something like uh, Giant Bomb? Their Let's Play channel is also big at the time. Uh, probably will be big uh, forever. Uh, <laughs> just to stay at that same level of, of awesomeness. Um, but it was like, uh, okay, we'll figure out how we do this. Uh, the tech kind of was in a different place in 2011. Uh, not the most accessible. Uh, we wanted to try to play all these console games and show just how much we love these things. Um, but I came in there and I was like, I've got this, this niche. I really want to actually do like a game studies reading of these games while also keeping it fun, keeping it light, keeping it entertaining. Um, and we just started doing that. We had our first channel. It was called The Professionalists. Hmm. Uh, many years later, many more iterations, falling out with friends, falling in with new friends, uh, collabs here, collabs there. Um, now, Rainy Day Let's Play has become this uh, very nice like channel of love that I've kind of been able to put all of my uh, my love and my art into, and it's become this much larger thing than itself. Uh, it's not like a it's not like a big popular mega channel like a lot of the other things. Uh, it's just finally something that I found that I love doing, and that's the most important part is that I love making Let's Plays in the style that I do them in. Um, and I love, I love experimenting with other styles, but as far as the Rainy Let's Play style goes, it's a, it's a solo Let's Play. There's one person in front of a camera um, playing a game and trying to talk about what is important about the game. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to do. If you haven't played a game and tried to talk while playing a game, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult <laughs> to be personable, to be engaging, and to be engaged with the game all at the same time because you are balancing the attention of uh, about three different things. And that's kind of what I usually talk about is these like four elements of Let's Play that all come together. Um, and over that time, over the time of making Rainy Day Let's Play, it's helped me understand the ethos behind Let's Play, understand what powers Let's Play and also a lot of the forms of art that come out of games. Because um, games as an art form have kind of been a very solitary body um, that have been influenced by a lot of things, but have also influenced a lot of new media that is, is brand new to the 21st century, um, things that are freshly being explored that represent who we are, as what, a, what a 21st century, what a contemporary person is, what they value, what makes them tick, what makes them think. Um, and so I use the Let's Play format as kind of a nexus of all of that, so live streaming, events, speed running, um, uh, what we do, not podcasting, but also the events organization like charity drives, all of those things uh, are also contextual with the Let's Play as an idea. Um, so all of that kind of become what Rainy Day Let's Play is in a lot of ways, and that's, it's just it's fun. It's basically my place to play and talk about what gets me excited about games. Okay, cool. And uh, you know, to pick up on something that I heard you talking about there, um, there's this idea of community. Uh, you know, you talk about the Let's Play community, and you know, we tend to talk about gaming in terms of like just gaming and gamers, but mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to lose sight of how big that is. Yeah. So if you could talk more specifically about the Let's Play community and what you think that ethos and those values are that you find there. Let's Play community is a uh, very weird place. It's very indicative of games. Um, it's a bunch of islands. You go to YouTube, um, you might have things like multi-channel networks, which is YouTube's corporate way of organizing all these channels into revenue streams. Um, but between the cultures of those Let's Play channels themselves, there's not a lot of overlap. Uh, people tend to stay within their groups and they create very like insular communities all over the place, like a messed up uh, an archipelago of just like blob of culture happening. Um, so a lot of those islands get lost. A lot of them um, kind of blip in, blip out, and it's exactly like what you see with game development now, 
where you have game jams, um, you have all of these little pockets of culture that are happening, and a lot of them are being localized geographically, which is awesome. Um, you see it on Twitch with Twitch channels. They'll pop up. Uh, they'll hit a stride. They'll pop down. Maybe they'll come back later. Um, very same kind of ways of organizing. And that's also a lot of why we organize around similar events. And you see this with other hobbies, too, um, whether it's role-playing groups that will pop in, they'll pop out, whether you see it with, um, oh, frick. Uh, pretty much most of their hobbies kind of do this. They have the same flow. Uh, and I think that's something that's really important to what defines uh, the game culture is this structure of islands. Um, and so sometimes there will be bridges between certain islands. Um, and sometimes they don't last. And so, yeah, that's really what it comes down to with, with the community, um, which is A, really safe for individuals, but it's really dangerous for groups. Um, because if you are a group of islands and you've grouped yourself together, uh, those are not necessarily bonds that may be strong um, and it can fracture groups very easily. Uh, it's not like a corporate structure that has very strict bonds and there's reasons for those strict bonds. Um, but it's also not as uh, overwhelming, bulky, and slow as a corporate structure can be. Um, so it's kind of like a, it's, it's this kind of nice mix, and that's, that's a lot of what we see in games culture, is we see that kind of thing. So that's kind of my views on the, the Let's Play culture and the Let's Play community. It's a really cool and interesting place. And Khalif, uh, you know, with podcasting, you know, of course, you're bringing in guests to be on your podcast, so mm -hmm. that kind of creates that same archipelago feel, do you think? It's a different kind of version of that, where a lot, <clears throat> lots of shows kind of um, break down super super uh, individually based on topic um, and you kind of kind of bounce those out depending upon like the greater genre so you have giant bomb you'll have like the giant beast cast you'll have like uh, gosh there's a couple of other ones unconsolable you have a couple of other ones that are in that group that are all gaming podcasts but they have very specific kind of topics that they go after and that kind of uh, uh, stratification kind of makes it a little bit different in that way where you won't see a lot of uh, bridges being built because folks are like I need my people <laughs> it's like I need I need everyone to listen to my show and no one else to listen to your show I don't like your show um, and you but you'll see it depending upon the people like we specifically always reach out to other folks who have dope shows because we want to I, I feel like the, the the industry has grown in a very interesting way Prior to maybe 10 years ago, podcasting wasn't a thing. Like, it wasn't a thing that people cared about. It wasn't a thing that people uh, sought out. It wasn't a thing that actually people spent a lot of time dealing with. Then Serial happened. And then Serial happened, and then Everybody and Mama has a podcast now. So it's very, it's very different in the way of kind of bridging those gaps and trying to go for both exposure for yourself and your brand, but also trying to kind of figure out your niche and also spotlighting other folks who you think are doing really good work. And I think I'm always of the, of the mindset that if you're doing something dope, I want to share your work with other people that I know so that that symbiotic relationship can happen. And it doesn't really, I don't lose people by showing you off. You know what I mean? If I show off something that you've done or something that any one of you have done, it, I'm not losing anything about that. I'm only gaining uh, uh, more people to kind of bridge those bridge those gaps. So it's always helpful to do that stuff. It just makes more sense to me. Yeah, sure. And I, that's something I heard you talking about earlier. You know, when you first start doing a podcast, yep. you have to figure out where's my unique voice in this because yep. you know there is so much internet out there. And, you know, what do you bring to the table? Is there ever any pressure? Do you feel as producers to try to find something that's, you know, directly marketable or that'll get you more attention or really differentiate yourself from the from the crowd? Well, it's it's uh for us, we have a really hard we we've we've decided to do the hard thing. That's that's the answer. Is we decided to do the hard thing in trying to do a show from this perspective that's not marketable to most bigger sections of the podcasting world, which has been fine for me. I don't care. I want, at the end of the day, if five people listen to the show, but we had a show like the one that we did with Lee, where she can have that conversation, or we did the one where, uh, you know, I'll shout out Akira again, where he talked about, Akira Thompson, who talked about his experiences of making games in that way. It means more to me to to make that 
the the focus of it. Mm-hmm. Sure, I want to get into all the conferences in the world. Sure, I want to hopefully make our, our our podcast marketable in some ways. But I also know that the hard thing is better. It's easier for me to go to bed at night and say, we did our spawn for good stuff. We we have a secondary thing that we do. It's called spawn for good. It's a charity. It's a charity platform that we did. That's basically uh, I call it the activist gaming platform, right? So we did one for Black Lives Matters in 2014, and then this this past year we did one. Uh, we raised money for um, the National Network of Abortion Funds for reproductive rights and abortion rights. And that, to me personally, was was necessary. It needed to happen. If that was our platform, we may not make money from that. People may not want to attach themselves to us, but that's not the point. Sure. Yeah, and you know, just with the amount of let's plays out there too, I imagine that's something. You know, how did you guys come about? deciding how you wanted to do your show or how you wanted to differentiate yourself? Yeah, a lot of it's trial and error on my side um, because Let's Plays are very big production. Um, you, you have to have the technology to uh, run games, to record them, to record any other per, uh, tangential technologies you want to apply to it, figure out how you want to curate the Let's Play. Uh, there's just so much, uh, like, subtle things that goes into creating a Let's Play. Um, and a lot of that gets boiled down to turn the game on, uh, let's just talk for an hour and a half while we play a video game uh, and go, which is a super important like distillment of all things that go into Let's Play. Um, and you kind of have to set up everything beforehand so that when you hit record, when you hit play on the game, uh, that you're ready for what you're about to go into, especially if you're looking at this and doing it all live. Um, and so when it comes to like creating that persona, creating your channel, creating the body of work that you do, it's constantly in iteration. It's just constantly, all right, what are we doing next time? What are we doing next time? Uh, you, you don't have, your, your brand is like a living thing. It's like a living document that changes over time. And you see that with everybody. Um, I like 2015, 2016 Markiplier. Not a big fan of 2014 Markiplier. 2013 Markiplier, that's, that's a pretty good vintage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, this is something that, that changes. It lives with you. Um, and a, that is especially because Let's Plays are huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that on the other side with podcasts, it's kind of uh, similar in the size and scope and how it iterates over time because of that. Yeah, I mean, you've seen a lot of folks do very specific things. Like, look at the, look at the, um, gosh, Game, uh, Game Over Greggy, kind of funny, folk, kind of funny folks. Yep. Like they've gone from a very kind of corporate branded version when they were in, with IGN to doing their own stuff and letting some of their personality come back out. But it's also had to kind of uh, kind of butterfly its way into more persona because you have to sell yourself a lot more because you don't have that backing of getting that check every week from IGN. You have to do it very differently because you're doing it through Patreon and people have to say, I really like you to give you money. And that's a very different yep. way of doing it. Yep. So it. So it changes over time. The thing that I would hope that most people, when they do it, and if you're going to decide to go into podcasting, you want to figure out what your thing is, try to be as close to yourself as possible. It's easier to keep that persona up than it is to keep up the one of trying to be someone else because that takes a lot of energy. And if you meet me on the street, I'm basically the same person that you would see on any show. So it's easier. Yep, yep. That's uh, that's something that I'm playing with right now too mm-hmm. uh, is because these are performative aspects. So you uh, when you perform yourself, it can be very uh, safe in the performance itself. Um, then there's always everything afterwards. Mm-hmm. So anything that's like a critical comment is like, oh, I kind of can't take that a little personally. I feel that. Um, and so then sometimes personalities come out as a defense mechanism against that, yep. which is very interesting. Um, and that's something that I also like to play with within the scope of my work. Um, and even let's play, and I figure this is the same with podcasts, but depending on what you're talking about and what you are playing, mm-hmm. different personalities will come out of the same person. Uh, I play Let's Plays, uh, I do dating sims a lot more queer-coded than I do, um, like, action games, hmm. um, which is just something that just kind of naturally comes out of me. 
because when I'm in flirt with boys mode, I'm in flirt with boys mode. <laughs> and when I'm in, I need to get out of this collapsing building or the monsters are going to get me, I'm going to get out of that collapsing building the monsters are going to get me. Uh, those are different people. Uh, and it's the same guy. It's the same blue hair. It's um, very interesting how that kind of flows. Um, yeah, living document. Yeah, and you know, to tie into that idea of you know performative, obviously, if you're you're doing a podcast or you're doing a let's play, there's also an idea of an audience. Mm -hmm. So I was yep. wondering how you kind of think about this idea of observation or participant observation, how that fits into the idea of like being a gamer or gaming as a whole. Well. Uh, the audience is the most important part of the Let's Play. Uh, it's one of the four elements of the Let's Play, as I like to put it. You've got the player, you've got the game, you've got the audience, and then you've got the uh, the medium, the medium that you perform your work. Um, and the audience is the most important part, because that's the part of the Let's in the Let's Play. Uh, without an audience, without any kind of perceived, like, I'm going to show this with, to someone, um, you don't really have a let's play in the same way. It is, that's a very different kind of media, different kind of work. Um, the fact that when you are creating a let's play, uh, whatever format that takes, if it's for, with screenshots, if it's with video, um, if you're just live in your living room, like, hey, let's play a game together. Um, if you are kind of sharing and documenting that work for an audience, depending on your audience, it's gonna change. And that's why we see the YouTube format of Let's Play uh, is very singular. It's not something that changes much. There's not a lot of change to it. Um, the most, probably the most powerful format that we've found, and I had a great conversation about this on Twitter yesterday, is the duo format, your super best friends play, your game grumps, um, where it's kind of a very one-size-fits-all, two people banter, one person's the player, the other person uh, is kind of Analyzing ideas or throwing like ideas into mm -hmm. this player's uh, into this player's game, um, they talk while they play a game and they do a clip and it be creates this like canon of channel. The whole channel becomes like this narrative of these two people playing a game together. Um, and yeah, because YouTube's kind of a very stringent platform um, where you have to create videos, they have to be of a certain style, you are going to put them in a playlist that is in a linear order. Um, they are going to be 720p, they're going to be 1080p. Um, there's, there's very little like flexibility on this. Um, because of that platform, because the audience that comes into that is also very specific and has certain ticks, certain cultures, um, it changes how you're going, you're going to let play. Um, yeah, that's just kind of that's how it goes. The audience is one of the most important parts of the Let's Play. Yeah, same thing on the podcasting side where it's it's a little bit different in the kind of reaction time between show between when the show goes live and when we hear about it, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yep. Um, because without social media, we would not know if people were listening. I mean, you get the numbers, the download numbers, but the actual reaction to a show doesn't happen as quickly as you would want it to in kind of like the feedback loop. Um, so we'll put up a show on Tuesday. We may hear something maybe Friday or Saturday that someone liked it. You know what I mean? But we'll, we don't have had a, a good amount of people download it because everything auto downloads and all that stuff. But hearing the feedback is very, very different in the podcasting game, where if you don't have folks who are sending you fan mail or sending you feedback letters or, or tweeting at you about stuff, you may not know you're doing things well, or you may not know what you got. So we sent out a, an interesting kind of um, survey. I, I sent out a survey because I was like, are you guys really listening to the show? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, is, yeah. is something happening? Yep. Or is, is like stuff going on? Like, are, yeah. you just, are you just hitting the button just to make me feel nice? Like, you know, like, <laughs> like that's cool and all, and I appreciate it. I love you. But... It, you know, what's happening? Or what are some of the things that you hear that you maybe like or don't like and stuff like that? And we got some great feedback on that that was like, you know, we got some demographics about how, how old our audience is, at least from the people who answered it, right? And our show skews, skews older than kind of, it skews at the top range of the, ga the, the gaming demographic, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, 
you know, my thing was like, is the show too long? And people were like, yeah, your show's a little bit too long. <laughs> Calm that shit down. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can do that, but I'll try. <laughs> you know? but, but, it's, but it's stuff yep. like that of, like, the interactions that you get with, with the folks who are following you and the people who are, like, paying attention to your, to your, to your, cre- uh, your art is, is, is super important. That stuff really means the world to us is, like, just feedback, but also why we continue to do it because they – we've been told that the conversations that we've been having are important to the space. So that, that makes a big difference. That's right. funny that you, you put it up like that um, because I've got a funny story about Let's Playing on YouTube mm. and this kind of goes back into the, the question of the audience mm. um, is that, I don't know if you all know this, but if you put a video on YouTube, it stays up there forever. <laughs> uh, a, a Let's Play channel, if you want to put an investment in a Let's Play channel, you can legitimately put like a five-year plan into your YouTube channel. Um, I was not always someone who dated boys on the internet. Um, I played Sweet Fuse at your side uh, on the recommendation of a friend Arden, and uh, it was an amazing game. I had a great time doing it. Um, it was a very interesting format to let's play in uh, after playing a lot of RPGs, a lot of action games, uh, just being able to sit and read and get into a lot of characters, play with voices. That was different. Um, and I didn't get any feedback back right away. Flash forward 12 months later, all of a sudden, this becomes one of my most popular video series with a very specific demographic that is not usually catered to in the Let's Play formula. Um, And as I've kind of grown, it's been something where like, yeah, I'll release a video, I'll look at it a week later, it's got like 20 views. Uh, I'll look at it a year later and it's got about 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And it starts getting feedback, starts getting comments. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, these are things that last for a long time, which is a very weird part of the the audience. And that goes for a lot of game stuff. Um, Twitch is the exception, and it's a beautiful exception. Like, it's very interesting that that's an exception to that because everything's kind of immediate. Everything's got a little bit more snap to it. Um, but you can still trend it very similarly in a lot of ways. Podcasting is not like that at all. No? no? <laughs> Nothing no. like that? Once your show is up and people forgot about that show, next show. Really? <laughs> and, it's, and it's okay, though, because it's kind of like it's, a, it's, it's time capsuled in a lot of ways, which is kind yeah. of nice. Because uh, a thing that a lot of folks don't do, and I suggest if you're in the podcasting game or starting it, once you've done your 10th show, go back to your first show and see what you did. Because a lot of the things that are in that conversation are very different to who you are ten shows later, and it can be even twenty shows later. Like we're, all, that. we're almost at, we're almost on our hundredth hundredth show, and going back to like show thirty, I'm like, what the fuck? Was that? <laughs> that shit was terrible. <laughs> Damn, you <yep>. suck. And, <laughs> but but the good thing was, you go back and you listen to the conversation, and if that same uh, uh, want and that same kind of energy is still there, then you know you're still kind of on the right track. And that's that's an important thing to kind of remember. I like that. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, that it sounds like this has been kind of a, you know, we think of creating a podcast or creating a Let's Play as putting something out there, but it sounds like also, you know, personally you kind of get a sort of development out of that, you know, and would you say that it's really affected personal growth or like any sort of identity in terms of being a creator, you know, oh yeah, cultural culture. This is the first thing I've been good at. <laughs> that's honest. That's like not yeah. the that's like not Maybe, the bullshit like, the answer. That's like seriously no yeah. no lie. This is the first thing that I've been able to hone have an idea, have a have a kind of a plan. And build on see, a craft? Yeah, build like, on a craft. Like I, I used to be a DJ. I, I used to have a college radio show. Um, and it, and I've always wanted to kind of expand that into something else. It wound up being this, but it's also been something where now I can actually look at it and be proud of it. Like I do feel that it saved me in a lot of ways from losing my mind at my old job. And, you know, a lot of folks that I meet now, you know, we have, we have the conversations about like, is something important? And personally it's important. Is it affecting the world in some ways? I hope um, I've gotten some great feedback letters from some folks who said that, you know, the conversations are, are changing thought processes for them. We had one of my favorite um, kind of letters we got was this uh, 65-year-old cat from Germany 
and he wrote he wrote to us and he said he's like yeah he's like I'd never really listened to hip hop music because that's when we had music in our show. Um, he's like I never really listened to hip hop music, and I've been a gamer for all of my life. And I never thought about the conversations that you guys are having on your show. And I was like, I'm done. I don't have to do anything else anymore. <laughs> that was good. That's all I need. You, did it. you made a difference. And that was the thing is, like, I, we went into it kind of wanting to hopefully make a statement and say, you know, these are things that we want to discuss and, and do it in a real heartfelt way. And hopefully it will touch someone. And then you get stuff like that. And you're like, I don't have to do anything else. I don't ever have to do another show. I can stop tomorrow, and that'll be it, and I'll be fine with that. Yeah. So, yeah, personal growth is totally a part of that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, to sort of bring it towards more like, you know, the uh, experience of playing games, uh, you know, I can remember growing up, and games lived in the living room, and you, you played them for an hour, and then, like, you went and did something else. It was just that was it. You know, I'm sure, like, you make jokes about Pong or Pac-Man or Mario or whatever. Uh, but, you know, increasingly we have... Uh, you know, we've had MMOs where there's in-game socializ socialization, so there's, you know, you're invested in that. We have VR on the horizon. I guess this year is the year of VR, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been told by the prophets. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, for a while, of course, we've had the video game critical community, which this is obviously a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, looking forward, um, how do you see that as a as a part of gaming? Do you, you know, do you think that's going to be increasingly something that's incorporated into games? Uh, you know, do you see your own uh, you know productions and participation in a, in a critical culture around games? Do you think that's becoming more and more important uh, at all? Where do you see those sort of developments going? Hmm. This was a really broad panel. <laughs> <laughs> What's the future of? Because it makes you it makes you want to try to make this like super faux deep answer, <laughs> which is future trend. Man, if I could just look forward into the um, we do there. I mean, I, I guess to a certain extent, um, the 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 best parts of where we are in the medium, both in podcasting and I would say probably the streaming and let's play communities as well, to a certain extent, is that the tech is there for everyone. And you can do it if you really want to. The people who are better at it than others are the ones who really invest themselves in it and make themselves available to them, to the audience emotionally. And I think that that is a is a huge part of it. I know you you have lots of thoughts on that, but yeah, yeah. Um, the interesting thing about Let's Play is is that they're a historical documentation of games. Um, that's something that's kind of usually swept under a little bit. Um, so your best let's plays on a, if you go game by game basis, are going to be games that are five years old, at whatever time you were looking at the things. Um, that is because the technology uh, has caught up to a point to where those maybe those consoles are emulatable. Um, the people are there to care about the game in a way that is specific to them, that helps them reflect off of themselves this the game that they like or enjoy or have some kind of emotion about it. It doesn't have to even be a positive emotion. Um, there's also just the accessibility of technology. Like, uh, if you watch 3DS Let's Plays right now, most of those guys are going to be people with cameras holding on to, like, the bottom screens and then trying to crop them into place, which is bulky. It's not that it's, it's bad. It doesn't create a bad Let's Play inherently, um, but it's hard. It, it's a hard thing to do. It's a barrier of entry. And so a lot of the uh, a lot of let's plays we go on a game by game. Like I want to see a good let's play of this game that I really like. Um, if it's brand new, you're going to get a bunch of people who are uh, let's playing a brand new game uh, that they have never seen before, which can have its own merits. Um, but they might be taking like a one size fits all approach to this specific game. Um, it might be part of their let's play. As far as like how it goes as a as a historical document, as let's plays as a histor history, um, it's kind of interesting. So it, like that comes away from the branding of a let's play, the face of the let's play, being uh, personas, being people, and kind of goes more to the other side of let's plays. Um, meanwhile, you've got a lot of great tech coming out um, that people are finding interesting ways to let's play. And so, how do you let's play a VR game? Those are questions that we have to like engage with, mm -hmm. yeah. um, because that is 
already kind of freaky. Doing Let's Play of a first-person game is difficult because if you move the trigger around too much, people get a little seasick when they watch you play because they're not in control of it. Um, Let's Plays of the Witness are a little difficult to watch right now because there's no reticle to focus on. And so watching the game go through is like, okay, I'm a little, little queasy right now. This is okay. Um, and so like all of these things, the sum of all these things, whether it's the game, whether it's the technology, uh, the people that it's playing, um, all goes into this kind of mess. And so it, it becomes a very interesting kind of conundrum where uh, there's new tech. I want to let's play it right now. I want to record it right now. I want to get the hits. I want to make it look good. You as, a, as an artist is, are being pulled in lots of different directions. Sure. And, uh, you know, to, to broaden this even more, which is you yeah. know, getting increasingly dangerous. Yeah, you know, let's, talk about, let's yeah. talk about space and time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, who knows? Are we here? We are in 15 years. We can have space time VR. Uh, <laughs> what so, people? Yeah, uh, so, you know, increasingly, you know, video yeah. games have gone, you know, they've always had more people and more diverse kinds of people playing them yep. than I think has been popularly acknowledged. Uh, but, you know, they're becoming so popular and they're increasingly becoming a part of the mainstream. Yep. And so a lot of times we'll see these comparisons between, you know, the classic one is when are we going to get the Citizen Kane of games or, you know, the interaction between Ooh. film and games. Um, we already have that. It's already been out there for years. Yes. And? Dive kick. <laughs> <laughs> have you not played dive kick? Yeah, it's pretty great. Dive kick is the shit. <laughs> <laughs> But so, yeah, we, we have these comparisons, and, uh, you know, how do you compare your own work in the multimedia game space to, you know, traditional arts criticism, or do you see it as being more of its own thing? I've actually got a great answer to this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you on this one. Um, <laughs> so, everyone, I wanted you to prepare yourselves, get your pencils ready. Um, <laughs> I identify Let's Plays as the, uh, the, the like, all time, the format, the thing that represents the 21st century person. That's kind of what I started this talk with. And, and what I mean by that is that it combines uh, games, obviously, um, it combines serialized television, it combines reality TV, it combines um, like sketch comedy, all, all the comedic forms. It is a performativity of individual pers people and persons on a massive scale. Uh, to the likes of which we've really never seen before. Um, it is It identifies with what people as individuals that live right now are looking for. Um, it kind of hits all of these triggers that have been built up by the 90s, by the early 2000s, and have kind of culminated into now any individual can make a television show of their own. Uh, what does that look like? Well, it looks like Let's Play. That's what we want to do. Um, and that's amazing. That's important. That's like, that's everything. Um, why games? Why do we want to show people our reaction to games? Um, because we want to feel. Because we are people, um, we want to have an organic experience being intimate with another person. Uh, and that's what Let's Plays are all about. That's why you have like the Fine Brothers doing kids react to X, Y, uh, person reacts to Y, Z. Um, the uh, Let's Play kind of embodies all of that into one like reciprocal format. I can go watch someone do a Let's Play, enjoy that Let's Play, and then make one myself on YouTube. Um, it's just kind of how technology and media have culminated uh, into this amazing kind of mess. Uh, and that's why it's really important for everyone to make Let's Plays. <laughs> it's very important to do that so that you can reach out yourself. Um, it's cool to be able to have an interaction with a game. Even if nobody like comes to the show, to be able to make that is something that's very important. It's, it's a craft. It's, uh, it's a craft. It's a media. It's an art form. Uh, it is something that defines who you are as an individual. Um, it, it's something to make. And with OBS now being something that's free and not too hard to use, um, it's accessible. It's accessible in, in ways that's never been before. So, yeah, that's my big answer to the big question is that let's play to the most 21st, early 21st century media that we have. <laughs> okay. yeah. And obviously podcasts are going back to sort of a 
earlier form of uh, entertainment if you want to look at radio, but how do you kind of feel about that thesis there? It's like I'm playing a phonograph in a room with no one listening. No, um, it's it's an interesting thing because I think I, I I we did it backwards in a lot of ways where again we're doing we're doing old time media if you want to think about it in those ways. Um, the beauty of what you're doing and what folks who are in the Let's Play communities and the Twitch communities are doing is that visually they're letting themselves blossom in front of you in many, many ways. The difference in the way that we kind of have to not combat it but but complement it is we try to give you a longer version and it's it's a longer version of a discussion in a place that's a little bit more intimate in some ways because it's in your head kind of sort of and you bring it with you wherever you go hopefully you bring it with you wherever you go um and and i think knowing that that's the way that people consume our media and more our content it it lends itself to thinking about the the way that we both produce the show the way that we have the conversations what topics we talk about because you can't really have discussions on bigger issues that may affect you as a gamer or may affect you in whatever version if you're a dev or if you're if you're a publisher or things like that in environments that don't really lend itself to it so it's like the platform is there but it also gives you a lot of leeway to kind of uh, be malleable about what you can talk about and how you kind of convey the the issues or discussions that you want to have that's kind of a weird answer but no, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, we're talking about this idea of you know you wanted to find a space for specific identities, and you wanted to have these safe spaces where you can kind of carve out your own voice. And yeah. It's a case of medium map matching method sure. because it's both broadcast but also really personal at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do we want to have any uh, questions? I just wanted to ask Salon about. I think I see some of the Let's Play things, but they're usually more like a mashup, like. Cloud versus Link, fighting it out. Oh, um, is that right? Or uh, are you thinking of like uh, Mashable to the series, like of the characters just kind of fighting each other, like a cartoon kind of thing? Yeah, but it looks like it's the real video game. I don't know. I was kind of curious how they were doing that. I guess uh, that definitely sounds like a machinima kind of thing, which is a very close predecessor to Let's Plays in a lot of ways, or at least the contemporary Let's Play. Um, so they're very similar, um, if I'm understanding what you're talking about right Yeah, and they're constantly talking about the game and like the different components that the characters have and how they might defeat each other. And... Right. Um, you also might be looking at a game of Super Smash Brothers, <laughs> uh, which is literally a game made to fight those characters together. Oh, okay. Um, or which is Or Mujang, <laughs> yep. Uh, there might be also a, an actual game of that, uh, which then would be very literally a Let's Play. Um, I don't really, like, as far as the def definition of Let's Play, uh, anytime you have someone interacting with a game and presenting that to an audience, that's a Let's Play. So uh, it's kind of a broad definition so that we can get a lot of different ideas. Um, but yeah, All definitely. Right, well, that was the only thing I've seen until now, so yeah. thank you. All right, and uh, go, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, first comment, comment, comment kind of slash question, but uh, my first Let's play. Um, I had just got a copy of Star Wars The Old Republic online, and I had just gotten a Razer Naga Epic gaming mouse. And I nice. Decided, like, so bring this in. Okay. Yeah. So I used the Razer game booth to record it, so there was no audio, but it was still kind of like, yeah, this is awesome. I get to <laughs> show my video game online. But, anyways, yeah, I understand the uh, right. excitement. I haven't gotten very many of them, but I'm trying to. Get into it. A question was: Are you guys familiar with the uh, Iron Ribbon? The Iron Ribbon. <clears throat> yes, it's a. Uh, so they you go to the website and it's a uh, it's like all these other ribbons they have, but it's specifically for gaming. And I figured maybe you guys can mention it on a podcast or something because not a lot of people are familiar with it really yet. I but don't. If you have not the, familiar. Uh, logo, the Iron Ribbon, it shows oh. that when you see bullying on video games. Um, that you have, you're required to do something to stop that bullying. Oh, uh, okay. oh, like a ribbon, like a, a social media ribbon. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, but it's that's called amazing. Iron Ribbon, and it's 
Oh, that's it's, really, it's got wings and stuff, but it's really cool because you guys are talking about things re related to gaming, and I thought, well, this is something, and I've heard a lot today about how there's, uh, so Iron Ribbon, pretty yep. cool. Um, yep. I actually have the logo on my Facebook. Nice. Oh, that's definitely super important. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so. I want to bounce off that to yeah. you. Uh, do you do anything, I mean, since your work is very much about who you're bringing on and how you're uh, managing the conversation, mm -hmm. um, how do you manage how how do you how do you create the audience that you want? Because I I would love an audience that didn't bully each other and didn't bully other YouTube. <laughs> I, I would love an audience that wasn't uh, an average YouTube stereotype audience. I think the, the the interesting part of that honestly has been our audience are weird extensions of us of uh, of each individual person. I am. I, I I kind of play the stereotypical straight man on the show, Cicero. And mind you, we're not doing this in character. This is just the way it's wound up being. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, and Cicero is more flamboyant and more kind of brash and and full of himself. And Sharif is like the the calming the calming waters. He like balances all yeah. of us out in a lot of ways. And to a certain extent, like that version of us has translated itself into the community that we've grown in a lot of ways, where. Um, We'll have folks come in, and when they talk to us, when we meet them at events and stuff, they're like, man, you guys are really fun. Cicero said some crazy shit. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. I didn't want him to say crazy shit, but he said crazy shit. And it was, but, but it's that kind of stuff with, like, that, that, that audience knows us now at this point. They know who we are. They know about our families. They know about all the stuff that we talk about in between shows and, and things like I hurt my ankle, and people keep laughing at me because I hurt my ankle. <laughs> you know, bring it up. But it's stuff that now people are, like, remembering those little, kind of little small anecdotes and things like that. And it's been fun to see that. I'm sure I'm sure when you think about the audience that you've built, are you thinking about not only just how they found you, like uh, acquisition, but also um, how, how's the feedback loop for you been? Has it been something that's been better, kind of dependent upon specific uh, playlists that you've put up, or has it been something that over the, uh, over the times you've done it has been very specific to... Um, just you in particular, as you as it's as interesting because yeah. uh, me as Solon has changed a lot over the last four or five years, especially because of Let's Play, because I've become a performative body, someone who has to do the drama, the stage lights, the crap, the acting. Um, yeah, a lot has changed, and it's weird because <laughs> uh, my show did not start out with. A 50% female audience, uh -huh. uh, and because I get I get these I get these numbers, I get all these stats like live. I get too much information from Google. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, here's your, here's a percentage for your Greece numbers this week. Oh, great! I'm glad I got these viewers in Greece. This is wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure weird? what I'm gonna do with that, but like I'm excited. That's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm trying to get that Greece fan base. Now Greece uh, loves people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it changes over time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and once I found out that I, I really wanted to have a Let's Play, um, I, I think that was actually the most respectful thing, was finding out those numbers, uh, finding out that women actually engaged with my channel sure. and enjoyed it and, and followed through with it and had longer uh, minutes per viewing time than other things. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm, I must be doing something right if uh, an audience that is usually maligned by a mainstream games audience uh, is into this. Uh, maybe I'm connecting with someone. I'm connecting with a certain group of people. Now I can actually start to build around that mm. and create like create a home out of that. And that's kind of what happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We had a question. Here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. You might have to dissect a question after. But actually, I've been thinking all the time you guys have been talking about. Uh, how games are still moderately accessible to a larger community and we're still pretty niche in the way that like we engage with them. But simultaneously, uh, I don't think that celebrity is formed around the people who are making games. I think it may be equally or even more being formed around people who are playing them 
and uh, talking about them, reacting to them. <laughs> because like, if I asked my mom to name one game developer, she wouldn't be able to do it, but she knows Anita Sarkeesian and people who are talking about games. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering from your perspective <clears throat> of being a persona that doesn't necessarily make games but reacts to them, uh, how, what is your perspective on that phenomenon? <laughs> I know specifically we try to not do that. We try to downplay ourselves as much as we possibly can <clears throat> because in the grand scheme, it's nice that people come to listen to us talk, but we want you to focus on the people who are making the media that you are going to consume. Because to me, I have people come on the show, and if there was no one listening, I wanted to have that conversation anyway. <laughs> so that's the part that makes me happy every week is like, oh, shit, we got to hang out with Adam Sessler for a week for an hour <laughs> and talk about why he did what he did. But then that part ingratiates you as a, as, a, as a listener to our show, but it also gives you an insight on him or her or whomever in a way that you didn't have before. And that, to me, is that part of that conversation that's really important is we do see that a lot where folks are like, oh, well, that person is that person, and that's really cool that they did this thing. But I'm like, but this is the person that made the thing that you really like. Why are you not giving them any respect or props or, or, or anything? It's, it's, it's a weird kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. i got a funny story with this. Um, so, yeah, I think you can, you can really say with, when it comes to celebrity, uh, PewDiePie is the number one most subscribed to channel on YouTube. Um, Markiplier is number two. And the funny thing about celebrity and how that all goes down is that the entire reason that PewDiePie is where he is is because of a shift in the Google algorithm. Uh, a little bit of math, a couple numbers moved here and there, and PewDiePie uh, and the Let's Play format at large becomes much larger than it ever was. Um, 2007, 2008, I want to say, uh, it was viral videos. Viral videos were king. Uh, they two minute long videos um, were just perfect amount of time for the short attention spans that we have as, as human creatures, um, which isn't quite honest. It's not quite true. Uh, it was that Google's algorithm at the time liked view count. It was, it was, view count was king. It was really the view count that was harnessing everything. And two minutes is a shorter amount of time than 11 minutes. Uh, that is just straight math. It's not that we have a short attention span. It's that that's just how Google's algorithm worked. Uh, they changed it to being something that merits uh, average time viewed. How much of a video are you watching? Are you watching 40 seconds of a two-minute video? Because 2 billion people can watch 40 seconds of a two-minute video, click out of it, uh, and that's not something they value anymore. They value someone who watches 10 minutes of an 11-minute video. Uh, all of a sudden, the Let's Play format, which was underground and niche at the time, uh, skyrockets and becomes huge because now the, uh, the things that take the backseat in the game section, which the game section of YouTube is very large, uh, trailers take a backseat, um, reaction videos take a backseat, and gameplay videos, headshot footage, uh, things like that take a backseat to these giant, like, weird 12-minute, let's look at a guy guy's face while he plays a game. It's a little weird, but all of a sudden, Google's algorithm loves it. They get more ad revenue out of it. Um, it works better for YouTube's business model. And then the manufactured output of that is PewDiePie. Uh, and that's just what happened. It, it wasn't necessarily something on purpose, uh, but it's just kind of a happy accident to, to everything. Uh, otherwise, I mean, let's playing as an idea, as an art, would probably be where it was uh, about eight to ten years ago when it was on the uh, uh, Something Awful forums, where it was like this nice niche forum uh, that did cool stuff, and they made these, they, they told their story of the game they played over screenshots, and they told the game that they played over video, they shared it with each other, people liked it but it was on one form. It was a very niche niche kind of thing. Um, now it's everything because there's money behind it. And there's money behind it because of math. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else to it. So celebrity is very funny. Uh, it's very strange. Like uh, at, when we did Indie 3 a couple of years ago, um, we got to have uh, Frick. Uh, slow beef, slow beef and digest. Mm. That was awesome. Chip Cheesem and Ironicus. It was amazing. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. All right. Uh, but when did you get Ken Klob? 
<laughs> like, right. I would I would blanch at the moment of the opportunity of getting to meet Ken Claude. Oh my God! Right, right, right. Uh, if you don't know, that's one of the designers on Golden Eye. Uh, and he's in Redmond, like right down the street from me. And I'm just like, <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's kind of ranges of celebrity that's in, individual to everyone. Time for one more quick question. That's tricky. Yeah, please go for it. Cool. So, um, personally, if I'm not like short of talking to somebody directly, I'm listening to podcasts yep. at all times. So I love podcasts, adore podcasts. The flip side, I don't like Let's Plays. <laughs> Do you have recommendations for both of those conditions? <laughs> Everyone, you should watch Geek Remix. <laughs> Geek Remix is the uh, is my favorite Let's Players. Uh, Mari and Stacy know what they are doing with their craft. They play very cool games. They move around a lot, um, and they just have a very nice body of work. Really recommend them. I, I huge fans and love their stuff. The Let's Players Let's Play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can mark that on the board. The let's Players Let's Play right there. And uh, uh, yeah. uh As far as Let's Players or podcasts? Or both. Oh, or, yeah. or, uh, podcasts that I really dig are um, Unconsolable, uh, Two Women Who Talk About Mobile Games, uh, yeah. Austin's show. You can shout it out whenever you want. Uh, Gamertag Radio folks, I really enjoy their stuff as well because um, they do really um, awesome work. Um, shit. Uh, Fun on me podcast? No, nah, we suck. Don't listen. <laughs> uh, and there's a couple other ones. I'll, I'll share them with you after. All right. Yep. All right. Thank you guys so much. Please clap. Please clap.